before we get started, just a quick note, spoiler alert. And we are adults, and I will try very hard not to use adult language, but this is the warning. Hello, my name is Jennifer. No. (laughs) (sighs) Okay. Hello, welcome to Fright Bites. My name is Jennifer. And I'm Sadina. Each episode, we will feature a short story or novella. You can read along with us by finding the full reading list posted on our website, lastlibraryontheleft.com, or our social media at LLOTL Podcast. And today we're going to be talking about Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones. It was published in 2020 by Tor.com, which as I'm writing my notes, we have many that were published by Tor.com. <laughs> and of course, I chose most of them and it's because I'm kind of a simp for Tor.com. I, like, <laughs> I mean, at least you admit it. So <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the first newsletters you were like, you need to subscribe to. <laughs> oh my God, that's right. It was. And I was like, okay. I did not realize your love for it until I started taking notes and writing down publishers. Like, wow, there's so many. (laughs) Yeah, I have a type in everything. Okay, so the summary of this, I'm just going to go very quickly. It's a teen prank gone awry. And that's all that you need to know, because this (laughs) book is crazy. (laughs) Also, it's the ultimate understatement, because when you said it's a teen prank gone awry, I was like, what the fuck is she talking about? Oh, right. (laughs) That is the summary. (laughs) It's the summary. It just goes off the rails almost immediately. (laughs) Yeah, the teen prank happens in a couple of words, and that's it. (laughs) So first thing you have to know when you read this book is that the narrator is super unreliable and he comes off unreliable immediately. Mm -hmm. It's not one of those times where you're reading someone and you find out later that they're unreliable because they've been dead the whole time or Mm -hmm. they're in an asylum, whatever. No, this guy comes off absolutely unhinged from the get go. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I thought I was like at first, oh, this guy's a little bit delusional. And then I thought, well, maybe there's a little bit of schizophrenia there. It was neither. (laughs) No, no. He's completely unhinged. It wasn't subtle, which was weird because you start off with this very unreliable narrator and then he pulls the whole like, this is how I got here. And like you go back and like find out about the prank and Mm -hmm. how they get to the part you started off on. And it seems so normal. Am I the only one who got Stand By Me vibes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I mean, now that you mention it, yeah, very much Stand By Me vibes. I just was like, mm, this is like your typical slasher, campy, 80s type <laughs> throwback. And so I was like, oh, teen prank. Mm, there's a murder on the loose. That's what I thought. But yeah, I could see the Stand By Me vibes. I definitely can. Because the whole bit about them hanging out during the summer, that was their whole world where they shape their identities and then they find the mannequin down by the creek that was like the dead body by the train tracks i guess i don't know just had stand by me vibes except with murder see (laughs) when i read this one it was while we were covering it by stephen Uh... king and i had just finished watching it the newer one and so i was like "Hmm, it's got stephen king it vibes with the kids and their place in the summer and their little cabin that they have or treehouse so that's what i was thinking but yeah, it's very Stand By Me, but with murder. It, and the reason I think I also thought it was Stand By Me, but with murder was that the way that the main character, Sawyer, unhinges, he really is trying to convince himself that the summer of their youth is the only thing worth protecting and that this move to college, this move to adulthood, their lives moving on is not worth. They have to be preserved and they have to be young forever. I don't know. It was just like mm-hmm. this weird, desperate grasp to hold on to something something had clearly shaped his identity around because mm-hmm. when he found out that two of his friends were dating or messing around or whatever he sounded like he became a little bit more unhinged yeah there are so many things that unhinge him yeah okay so in the prank is that they find this mannequin i guess during the summer they use this mannequin in all sorts of ways it was their buddy <laughs> wacky shenanigans it reminds me of that movie oh, is it Weekend at Bernie's with the dead guy? Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah. It was kind of like Weekend at Bernie's. They had this mannequin 
and I took with them everywhere. That's kind of unusual. And when they went back to school and the teens obviously grew out of it, this guy, sorry, you said his name was, but what about Manny, the mannequin? <laughs> he clearly associated with Manny on a deeply personal um, level, which didn't he even cut up the mannequin face? Did he? I can't remember. Yes, he like wore a mannequin face. Oh yeah, he did. After oh, the God. first accident. Because that was the other thing. The first death was definitely accidental and was not a death because you find out later the teen wasn't whatever okay so guys <laughs> what sparks this murder spree is that he thinks that after they abandon manny the mannequin that manny has been infused by all of their love and friendship and then was abandoned and he was eating miracle grow to grow into this massive attack of the giant woman type tower and he threw a 18 wheeler off the freeway and crashed into one of their friends houses and he was gonna yeah. systematically murder all of the friends for leaving mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. but the 18 wheeler it was a fluke it just happened to go off the road because drivers are underpaid and on strict schedules and the guy yeah. was mostly behind the wheel and ran into this family it was unfortunate yeah. but his lawyer goes absolutely off the deep end over it you know what let's rewind a little bit because like the part that i absolutely loved and i was like oh god yes i can't wait to get into this book was was when they're in the movie theaters the prank is that they've taken this mannequin and they've put it because you have to buy tickets right so they put it in someone else's seat in the theater and they think that they're gonna mess with their friend who's a worker at the theater like an but, usher yeah and then the mannequin gets up and walks out <laughs> And the thing is, is that they all see that, right? They all see it. And for me, I was like, oh, hell yeah, haunted mannequin. That, right? That's what I'm here for. This is where the horror starts and the mannequin's going to chase him around. Not thinking that this dude has taken that <laughs> in and thinking like, well, I got to kill them before he gets to them to protect them. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm still confused as to how <laughs> the mannequin got up and walked away. Because I know that one of the friends was trying to justify it. He was like, that's not what we saw. Mm -hmm. What we saw was just some other person dressed similarly get up and leave and we in the fear and the confusion we thought it was Manny but it wasn't it was never explained as to what happened to the mannequin the only thing I think is that Sawyer planted the mannequin and he told them he planted the mannequin but he'd gone off the rails long before and uh, there was no mannequin oh <laughs> that's the only thing I could think of because he was just I don't know he was just so off the rails like you you said just and i mean it just i don't know so okay i have all these theories that's like mostly what my notes are just theories <laughs> i couldn't at first i couldn't get behind him being the murderer because i was like what are his motives why fixate on the movies why fixate on the miracle grow literally sawyer's the murderer but why is it the loss of normalcy of the summer youth is it a status quo thing of the friend circle mm -hmm. the loss of that and i was like but he's also constantly justifying the murders mm -hmm. constantly he the very first lines of the book are a manic explanation of the deaths that you later find out are murders but there was a part that got me and I was like okay this is not manic because as he was making his way through his friends he's gearing up like a serial killer he's honing his craft he has to his friends have to die young but instead of a murder suicide pact he's going after them and choosing better. them in, a, in order right he's choosing them in a specific order but he's also mm -hmm. getting better at it he's mm -hmm. fixing the things that he did wrong and that's what using the same murder weapon walking slow like a serial killer in like an 80s campy slasher film and he was hyper fixated on the movie that they all last saw together a lot of it was just serial killer behavior and then he gaslit them at right okay, before but he, fairness, he gaslit himself <laughs> i mean that's true <laughs> Because I think the mannequin mask was a sign that he was faking his grief or hiding his grief. Maybe he was dissociated. I think you're right. Maybe he was dissociated long before this murder spree. And Maybe. the mannequin mask was the literary symbol representation of that. Oh, God. This dude was so weird. <laughs> God, he was crazy. Yeah. And this is my first. I think this is my first. Wait, 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 wait. What else has Stephen Graham Jones wrote? He wrote The Last Final Girl, which we'll be reading. He wrote mm -hmm. Mongrels, which is super good it's a werewolf he wrote the only good indians which is one a ton of things he writes great stuff i mean i have my heart is a chainsaw my desk mm -hmm. at work 
this was my first Stephen Graham Jones book. Then I was like, oh, <laughs> this maybe is not the best one to go first. Because I was like, what were you thinking? <laughs> That's the interesting thing about him, though, as an author, is that his writing style is different in each story. It, oh. He changes the way he writes in order to fit the story he's telling. So one of the things, it wasn't until you said Miracle Grow that I'm starting to put some things together. Because I wrote, I know Manny is short for mannequin, but what if it's symbolic of becoming a man oh my god jennifer you've blown my mind (laughs) because i think you may be right because he has that anxiety about growing up and not being with his friends right and then the miracle girl like growing up stuff oh my god jennifer we swap places (laughs) (laughs) that was like so insightful i think you're on to something it makes sense for him because he's Mm. just so fixated on it yeah okay that also kind of because the miracle grow thing was so weird to me. That's what you give to plants when you speed up their natural yeah. process. Listen, <laughs> that one scene at the table where they're like, they took the miracle grow. His miracle grow is missing. I'm like, what kind of conversation is this to have at the <laughs> dinner table? And oh, he's man. freaking out. He's really <laughs> freaking out. That's the only thing I wrote, really. I just feel like Manny is symbolic of becoming a man just because of the end. Because he talks about his youth and what he remembers and mm-hmm. growing up and how it's going to be so different and how he liked the one girl that he killed and Mm -hmm. uh, i don't know so i wish that i had taken more literature critique classes because i know weather plays a big role in literature Mm -hmm. and so the storm at the end i know had way more significance than i read into it i really would love to hear more about the ending because the ending was so abrupt that Mm -hmm. first death was not actually dead she came back and she brought this tornado with her and it ripped through a drive-through theater like an outdated version of the movies that they always went to like Mm -hmm. it destroyed everything up rooted everything and I feel like it just was so symbolic of something and I feel like I'm just right I'm right there on the precipice and I don't I can't get it (laughs) and the first girl was the friend from the movie theater right Mm -hmm. what if because the prank started by them wanting to because she had responsibilities which is why she had to take the job so what if the tornado is her retaliation to him trying to get them all to go back to childhood I don't know. No, I kind of get where you're trying to go for there because the, mm-hmm. so the whole thing is that she is working as an usher as punishment. Oh, they right. Part, punishment. Yeah. They parked the family car or something mm-hmm. on the yard and not only did it mess up the flowers that her mom had planted, but it collapsed the septic tank. Mm-hmm. And so it required thousands of dollars of repair. And so she was forced to get a job, which like fair, but then they kept kind of teasing her. They were harassing her at work at the theater, got her in trouble with her manager and stuff. Yeah. And they were banned and she almost lost her job. So she was like already kind of frustrated with them because she needed this job because it was kind of the only way to get out of hot water for her to come back in this whirlwind of a tornado that came out of nowhere and, and ruin a childhood favorite there at the drive in yeah. theater. For some reason, I'm connecting her with their childhood and then responsibilities you get mm-hmm. when you get older. I don't know. She could also represent consequences. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because she I mean, could. she was forced to get the job because of consequences consequences of their actions in the car mm-hmm. and the septic and then when he went on a murder spree she was the consequences mm-hmm. i think you're on to something yeah it was so was a weird book but it was <laughs> <laughs> what i enjoy out of it is the fact that i thought it was weird and then you're reading it and you're like what the <laughs> <laughs> we mutually agree like this is, was a weird one not that it was written badly or anything it was no. very well written it was just this character we're like what the f are you doing dude yeah sawyer was not great no he wasn't great i so i laughed at him a lot because i was like i had that awkward laugh like i don't know <laughs> what you're doing but okay <laughs> He was very weird. Yeah. And he took things literally too far. Mm -hmm. Let us know what y'all think because y'all let us know. What did Mm -hmm. you think about Sawyer and his bananas attempts to recapture youth? (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) Right. Or deal with his anxiety of growing up. (laughs) Yeah. Like, bro, we all have anxiety in high school, but we're not all just murdering our friends to preserve the memory. No, we adapt unhealthy habits like daily coffees (laughs) and avocado toast. (laughs) be more like us good this was a good one though i felt so attacked when you said avocado toast but true i mean it is what it is that's the things that we do oh my god (laughs) 
Get yourself a nice healthy caffeine addiction and some avocado toast addiction and call it a day. Have a therapist too, like on (laughs) speed dial (laughs) and read a good horror. Yeah, right. This was entertaining. I would like to see it turn into a movie because I would like to see who would play who and who would do what. Oh man, you're right. It's like right up your alley as far as classic slasher type stuff. This is, you would get a kick out of it, I'm sure. I I would be in the theaters watching it and I would probably (laughs) love it. It. <laughs> this is so campy and so funny. So we hope y'all enjoy it as much as we sort of enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I guess. And with that, we will end today's and we'll see y'all tomorrow. All right. Bye. If you liked listening to us ramble on about horror, subscribe to our podcast and tell your friends. And if you would like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Instagram or Facebook at LLOTL Podcast. Check out our website by going to lastlibraryontheleft.com. Be sure to visit our About Us page to discover our two truths and a lie. Or if you'd like to send us an email, you can reach us at somethingwicked at lastlibraryontheleft.com.